Um, my name is Jenny Judah. I am with Bosch. I've been with Bosch for about 15 years, and in my current role, I have the opportunity to support Bosch's GSA contract. Um, Bosch Security Systems is the only um, Bosch legal entity to hold their own contract, um, and it, we're really grateful to do so. We offer a lot of great products from the video side, intrusion, access, um, all with pre-negotiated pricing, um, COTS, uh, TA compliant, NDA compliant, so it's a great list of products um, for our end customers to utilize. Um, our contract can be found on GSA eLibrary, um, GSA Advantage, um, through our website, and I'm over here till 4 o'clock today um, next door if you have any questions about GSA and um, what solutions we have. I did want to note for GSA, we utilize participating dealers to serve our end customers, um, so we have a list of those as well incorporated into our contract and also on our website. Um, so if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I have the privilege today of welcoming um, John Weckenborg and Jeff Drews, um, the industry experts, to help um, teach you guys some more today. So thanks again, and come visit me if you have a chance. All right. Well, thanks, Jenna. And uh, thanks for having us out, guys. I appreciate Steve and the Chesapeake team for inviting us out to speak. Um, to talk a little bit about perimeter intrusion detection today and layered solutions. Um, get into it so you guys can get an idea of what we're looking at today. Basically, we're looking at best practices. Uh, the two of us have both worked for many years dealing with a perimeter intrusion detection system. And the one thing that we have learned is that you cannot be successful in a perimeter intrusion detection system if you do not create layers and multiple technologies agreeing that things are going to work together. So today we'll be talking about physical barriers, samples, of what the IVA looks like. Um, a lot of things that uh, go into your everyday perimeter intrusion detection. So to start the conversation about PIDs, we, we sort of start with the foundational principle of deter, detect, delay, assess, and respond. You have to look at and understand that, that the asset being down here on this end, uh, there's a big misnomer in the industry, and, and maybe not with us as security professionals, but but to the, to the commonplace that a fence is actually a delay mechanism. It's not. Uh, study after study after study has shown that fences can be scaled within three to four seconds. The real delay mechanism um, would be the space between the actual perimeter and the asset that you're trying to approach. But that fence is a deterrent. It speaks to the old principle of a, a lock keeps the honest guy out, right? Um, a fence is going to keep the, the, the honest person out. It, it, it presents a message and says, hey, we don't want you past this line. But the bad guy who we're trying to protect against, he doesn't care about that fence because there are many ways to scale fences. And so us as Southwest Microwave parts of this, this is a slide from one of my slide decks. So we talk about our three core principles of detecting. So we've deterred with the fence. We're going to have different layers of detection that we're going to dive into really deeply today. Um, and here we see a fence detection, buried cable, microwave, and then the delay is the space, and then the assessment is at the camera level. Now, John's going to very eloquently describe that assessment, uh, cameras have gone beyond assessment now. They're part of the detection process as well. And then ultimately, with all of this data, how do we respond? What's the proper response based on what we find? So what we're looking at here is a typical perimeter. But what we're really not showing is that in today's world, we have to look at everything in 3D. Everything is a sphere. We have to worry not only what's coming through our fences, but we need to know what's coming under the facility, what's coming over the facility. So there's different layers of protection. There is no single technology that's going to make this happen. So what we do is we blend technologies. Um, here we're talking about fence detection, ground detection, uh, LIDAR, radar to pick up drones or anything that may be coming in from above and really it comes down to what was the risk assessment and hopefully there was a risk assessment. If not, you really need to incorporate people to see what, understand truly what the risk is. Some of our largest customers, when, uh, let me rephrase this, when I first heard the uh, acronym PIDS, Perimeter Intrusion Detection System, the first thing I thought about was, oh, we're trying to keep people from the outside getting in. Well, then I found out 50% of my customers are more worried about what's leaving the facility than what's coming into the facility. So one of the key things that you have to be clear about is what side of the fence are you protecting? 
Some of them will care about things that are coming in, but at the, the reality is they're more worried about things leaving. This is what Bosch's core PID solution looks like. And of all things, the, the center is the 9512 alarm panel because that's actually a gateway into a lot of other technologies. It could be PSIM, it could be, uh, say, Genetech, Milestone, whatever. But it allows us to bring things in either through hardware connections or MQTT connections. Um, there's a lot of technology that can be blended through that gateway that's actually an alarm intrusion panel. Our typical fence lines are going to look with both a thermal camera and an HD camera sitting right next to each other. And the reason we blend those two together is because a thermal cannot identify an individual. It cannot get the identifying characters. That thermal is really looking at is that we're using is actually a very intelligent motion sensor. Um, the analytics in the HD camera is the same. One of the biggest problems that we run into is that environmental conditions are going to affect how well the thermal is going to work or how well the HD is going to work. But when you blend the two together, it's very rare that you'll find a weather element that will keep one or the other one, one or the other technologies from working properly. And in many cases, we will. Um, tie them together and have the analytics agree. So two is, uh, one is none, two is one. They both have to agree that they see something going on before they report. Uh, the other thing is salute a queue. When an alarm comes in, we have the PTZ camera that will salute a queue, lock on the individual, and then follow the individual that created the alarm. So we're always on target. We use different levels of technology to do this. We have our thermal cameras, we have our HD camera starlight, and we have the IR illuminated. At the same time, we're tying this stuff into radar systems in many cases, and the uh, MIC camera that we're showing here can look above the horizon, so it can actually track the uh, drones or anything coming in from above. License plate recognition on the gateways, on the uh, gates is very big, uh, the driveway entrances. Um, video management, obviously, we want to document everything that's going on at the same time so we can go back and forensically see what exactly happened in that event. IP speakers, this is a real big deal on perimeters for us today. Um, almost every customer that I have done a perimeter intrusion de detection system for have asked us to be able to give a message at the fence line, but at the same time, have the ability to send a different message to handheld radios to dispatch individuals to the location. And here is basically the workstation management system, the UI that your officers are going to use to see what's going on within the system. And by compounding these analytics, it just makes the entire security force much more efficient. Here we're talking about different technologies that we're blending together. Um, you'll see infrared detectors, you will see WISP radar systems and different types of radar systems. Again, um, we're using the buried cable, seismic, microwave, uh, fence detection, and obviously uh, the camera systems looking down, uh, IR. That's the type of things that you'll see, but there's no absolute system that's going to work in every environment. You have to get out there walk the site, pay attention to what the customers are asking for, and make decisions based on those factors of what technologies you're going to blend together to make this a successful system. So here, uh, to expand on what John's talking about, and, 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 and we've referenced this a bunch of times, we, he just made the statement, there is no one complete solution for anything. Um, and so there, the next two slides I'm going to go through are different factors that you have to look at and uh, analyze when you're determining what type of sensor is best for your environment, what type of sensor is best for based on your external factors. Uh, if you have a fence line and want fence detection system or, or camera, thermal, or whatever, but you've got foliage that's so built up that the camera can't see the intruder, that the, every time the wind blows, the trees are into the fence causing nuisance alarms, that's not the solution for you. Now, it may be the solution, but the solution is landscaping, right? right? But you have to figure these things out. You have to address these situations when you're determining your, your, your setup, your layout. 
Uh, wildlife is another deal. Uh, we deal, Southwest Microwave, we do line detection sensors, right? We're primarily at high security sites. We have a definitive line and we will provide a sensor that will detect no matter what, somebody crossing that line. Oftentimes though, uh, I have sites, I'm going to one next week, that they're going to have a buried cable solution around a large perimeter, there's nuclear material stored on the inside, and they have this big wall, and the rest is just open. And I've made it very clear over and over, I have it in writing over and over, you will detect animals. This system is designed to detect deer. If you want to detect an a, um, a 80-pound crawling human, you're going to detect a deer. Now, cameras and analytics, they can then be coupled in there to, to differentiate that and identify those type of things. But Southwest Microwave looks at it from a, I've got to get detection no matter what in a critical site. So you have to take these things into consideration. Not every type of sensor works well over bodies of water. Matter of fact, most don't. Um, there's changes in temperature. There's, there are sensors that work. There are sensors that we use. But you can't just take any sensor and deploy it. Uh, radars, long range, early warning detection. If you don't have a line of sight because you've got structures in your way, then those sensors are blinded by what buildings are there. You have to take these things into consideration. And finally, we put regulations up there. Um, it's shocking, but regulatory authorities, like if you have a, a site within a city limits, there may be city rules that say you can't have razor wire. There are all, many municipalities that say you can't have electric fence. You can't have this, you can't have this, for aesthetic reasons, for safety reasons, for a lot of different things. But you have to take this whole scope into, into, into play. Next, unique environmental conditions. Um, John mentioned earlier that uh, in certain situations, uh, thermal can't identify, a camera if it can't see it, if there's not enough pixels on target, but there's not many environmental conditions that both of those layered together can't differentiate and, and actively uh, be successful in that environment. But you have to take into consideration of what your environment is. There are places that it's cold. And the normal standard ratings of minus 40 degrees become really important. Other applications where that doesn't matter. There's areas where there's heat. Snow, sand, I talk about all the time um, because we sell microwaves, the, the beam length of a microwave is, for instance, let's say it's this long, whereas the, the beam length of a, of a light is, might be this long. So any technology that's using light is going to be more susceptible. I'm not saying that it's broken or it's not going to work, but it's going to be more susceptible to radar or microwave because when I've got to go through snow, I've got to go through a water droplet, I've got to go through sand, this beam length that's this long is less disturbed by that interference. So you have to take into consideration what these um, sensors are capable of. What is their core technology? And as we said from the beginning, there is no one specific sensor that is an end-all, be-all for everything. Uh, not yet. Maybe 20 years down the road, we're growing, we're getting to that place. But for now, we have to layer these technologies. That's right. So here are different types of facilities that are employing uh, PID systems. We're looking at airports and critical infrastructure. Um, sometimes we actually end up with a situation where there is no fence. They just want to know who is crossing into this field or who's entering a uh, dead zone. At that point, we, we can create virtual fences. Here you see the functionality. You have a guy on a thermal walking into a Alarm zone, once he crosses that line, it's gonna go into alarm and send an alert. Um, here we got a bunch of radar also backed up with camera systems and this is what it looks like. It's just a complete layered system. Here you've got uh, PIR and along with the MIC cameras, we have radar systems. Here's a radar system that can actually follow drones coming in. So it's all about layers and that's what we're really talking about here today. So. This is a, some photographs off of an actual uh, PID system that we have installed. And this is what a typical pole looks like for Bosch. Um, we will have the thermal camera, the HD camera, which is a six megapixel uh, X-series starlight camera. And we have a PTZ camera. And that PTZ camera actually, in this instance, has a white light on it. And that white light doesn't turn on until it's been told to salute a queue. 
So their, the customer's um, idea was they wanted that light to make people understand that they've been seen and they've been documented now. It was all about alerting them to get them off the fence line. And here you'll see the way the customer set this up is if they came within 24 feet of the fence, it was a warning. It warning the interior people that you need to back away from that fence. When they hit the second um, 12 feet, at that point, it's a full alarm. They're going to salute a queue, going to send the dogs. Police are going to get dispatched. One of the key factors of this is that we're also placing these poles every 200 feet. And I know we do a lot of rabbit run tests and things like that. And the thing is they want us to shoot 100 meters, 200 meters. Mm, that's not real realistic on a true PID system because you, to be effective, you have to be able to get personnel into a very tight location because people can close a thousand feet quickly when they're running. So it's really about getting your targets tight. We're running them in Europe. I'm doing this every 60 meters. I'm placing a pole. When I'm doing this in the United States, it's every 200 feet. I'm backing this up with LIDAR. I have just products on the fence lines. We're um, saluted Q with the LIDAR system. And the beauty of adding the LIDAR to the levels of detection is that the LIDAR system will put a unique identifier on every target that's in the within the facility. And the individual that created the alarm that made that camera turn and look will follow that individual. But I don't know if any of you guys do quail hunting, but the, in, a, in a covey of quail, one quail will sacrifice itself and fly over here. But there could be 12 other people over here. Well, if the camera's looking over here, I don't see these 12, but the LIDAR sees it all. And it's doing people counting in real time. So you do know, and forensically, you can go back and say, oh, wait a minute, this shows this guy jumped the fence, but there's 12 other people that were less than 100 meters away. What's going on? What, are they involved in this, or what's going on? You see what I'm saying? It gives you more information to become more efficient when you're doing your investigations. Here you'll see, I got some videos here, so you want to click on that? Yep. This is basically somebody walking up on the fence line, and you'll see it went in but they crossed all the way in, and now they, the PTZ would have slewed a queue, would have set off the audio message, and send an alarm off, and they just took off. Here's a, one where a group of people walk into it, same type of thing. And what you're seeing is the cameras are classifying, so as Jeff had mentioned earlier, he, he just tells you that somebody's in that area. We actually can classify human beings from everything else. We can classify vehicles, we can classify humans, we can classify bicycles, uh, buses, trucks. So we can get a lot more uh, in depth as far as what we're trying to detect with the cameras without ending up with a ton of false alarms. And then same thing here, they're gonna walk out. This one here, I believe, is actually in inclement weather. It was uh, raining and snowing that day. But you'll see there's rain and snow uh, coming down that day, and there's no false alarms. The shadowing's not causing problems. It's, it's rock solid. Um, go to the next one. Here's a, where we're talking about classification. This guy here should not be in a zone, in a vehicle zone. And you'll see it's red because he's a human being. He should not be out there. You'll see the truck will pass through there and completely be ignored because it's a vehicle. It belongs in the vehicle lane. So we're able to classify when people are human beings versus anything else are walking into areas that they don't belong. So this is another really key piece to this product project, and that is communication. We are putting um, IP speakers out on the fence lines, and those IP speakers are actually uh, giving a pre-recorded message, and the communication can either be through SIP or they can be done as a uh, HTTPS command from the camera. So the camera sees something. It sends an HTTPS command to the speaker directly, and the, and the speaker then will deliver a pre-recorded message. Um, and a operator could easily just pick up, hit the button, and talk to that speaker through any SIP protocol phone system and communicate. There's a microphone in those speakers, 
and that microphone is effective out to 150 feet. I actually could hear conversations from 150 feet away with that microphone, which was really impressive. I've spent quite a bit of time playing with it. We have a long throw version of it and a short throw version. We also have a module that is an IP module that can be tied to any 8 ohm speaker. So that's another thing that um, you can do. If you already have the speakers out there, uh, the module's 35 watts and it can uh, be tied to a 70 volt uh, speaker or a uh, 8 ohm speaker, it's selectable on the back. So this is really where we talk about layering and this is one of the sites that we have an install at. And basically what we have here is, um, this is a radar system. This is a radar system and it's kind of blacked out but I have a LiDAR system sitting up there. And the LiDAR system and the radar systems, these, each, all these have different jobs to do. Um, this one's looking for drones, this one's ground radar, and the LiDAR is ground LiDAR. When these two guys agree that something's going on, one is none, two is one, bam, we get the alarm and we are able to uh, salute a cue with the cameras and send the message. Now these were on the perimeter of an airport and they actually, uh, were going a lot further than 200 feet. They were probably going 100 meters. So it's pretty impressive how far out that technology was actually able to pick things up. Here is uh, our integration with one of our major partners and that is Echodyne Radar. And what I'm showing here, go ahead. Um, you'll see a, a drone and then another drone will fly in. And the Echodyne was able to turn and grab us. Now, what we have going on here is that Mavic drone is about the size of the palm of my hand. And it's, it's able to lock on that with that MIC camera and follow it wherever it goes as long as it's within the uh, focal length of that camera and the Echo Dine doesn't let go. I mean, it, it shoots a long, long way, over 100 meters, uh, able to uh, keep, keep a lock on those cameras. We talk about integration and, you know, John spent the last couple of minutes talking about cameras and, and, and IVA and all those things, but, but our sensors still come into play in this stuff at, at a high level and especially the, the higher level of security of site that you're looking at. We're going to get into that a little bit more. I wanted to, I pulled this from a marketing uh, the video we have for a plug in the milestone um, at our booth next door. We have a full working integration into Bosch. Um, I've got two of my different sensors. We're turning thermal cameras there based on uh, different alarm zones, microwave turning uh, regular cameras. Um, you can do anything with this. This video is going to, I'm going to show you our three different sensors all in about 30 seconds. But the, the point is I'm trying to make is all of this is fully integrated. Um, whether it's that LiDAR solution, whether it's a drone detection, whether it's that fine line, and no matter what, nobody can cross that line, we have the ability in an integrated platform to turn on that audio, to, to pre-record data, to, to do whatever we want. Um, turn on lights. A common thing today is uh, at a fence line, lights that will stun or blind based on uh, detection, based on uh, alarm threats. So this uh, is a milestone integration and I'll sort of talk through it, but essentially we've got uh, a fence zone set up here. Um, one of our guys in our office was climbing a fence back there. Jonathan immediately turned. You notice the camera turned before the alarm even triggered here, which is important. And then also in this next part, you'll see we have both a buried cable and a microwave. Um, and it will do the same thing. It triggers the alarm. It turns the camera right to the location where he crossed that, uh, that barrier. These are some of the partners that we work with regularly. Um, Milestone Genentech is two of the largest uh, deployments that I have out there when it comes to PIDS projects. So we do a tremendous amount. Linnell is another huge one. I mean, Linnell, I've, I don't think I'm on a site that doesn't have Linnell. Um, but as you can see, these are all people and opportunities to get together with and we will uh, integrate with all of these and we have direct deep integration with every, everybody you see on the screen. And most sites, I would say, speaking for John, are going to have more than one. That's You're right. going to have layers of these different technologies That's right. uh, based on the, uh, the threat or the risk analysis. Okay. So basically what we're showing here is um, who, who really sets the, creates the principles or decides what are the principles and what are the regulations. Um, 
really, these are the guys that I have leaned on. These are the guys that I've had the opportunity to get out and do testing with. And I've learned almost everything that I've learned in this industry about this organization is through these guys right here. They have uh, allowed us to set our gear up on their sites. They test it, they try to break it. They, they work very hard and they are very good at what they do. So um, this is where the standards actually come from. So it, this was a, uh, a slide that John had from a previous presentation. And when we started working on this, I looked at it and said, wow, I work with every single one of these agencies. Um, yeah. I, it's to the fact that I then looked at this research lab testing and said, not only have all these, these groups tested my products, but my products protect every one of their uh, sites. Um, it's, it, it just shows the, the, not just integration between Bosch and Southwest Microwave, but within the industry, it's the same approval authorities. My favorite one on this list, and I point this out all the time because I like the way they do their testing as far as for perimeter security, is Safe Skies, the National Safe Skies Alliance. They're a group outside, of, they're situated right outside of the Knoxville Airport. What I like about them, they're funded through, um, their primary focus is in the transportation airport industry. However, uh, and they're funded by the TSA. But what they do is a nine month test. So you get four seasons worth of data. Uh, we're on all the Air Force approved testing and all that, but they test for two weeks uh, in, the, in the warm. Once you pass warm weather, you get to go to a cold weather site, which Fortunately, I have to go at least once a year. It's minus 29 <laughs> last time I was there. I'd rather not go, but uh, you want to be on those lists. But it's a two-week test and a two-week test and then a couple of weeks of NARFAR testing where Safe Skies will run for nine months straight. They'll go out there and test in the middle of the weather, applicate, you know, and then they'll provide almost like a consumer report. Anybody with a .gov, .mil email address can reach out to them and get full reports on not just my sensors, my competitor sensors, they cameras, they do um, different kind of risk and threat assessment and scenario testing for the airport industry. It's a really, really good group. If, you, if you've never heard of them, I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, and then, uh, although we haven't, you know, our sensors don't necessarily apply to partner testing with some of these, we have plugins with Genetech, Milestone, uh, we are TAA and DAA compliant, all of the above. And, and these, these pictures here are just different test sites that, that are either John or I's, or most likely we have both, We're both, both of usually us here. in there, yeah. Okay. So here's the thing, we have classifications when we're looking at these projects, critical, important, and like to have. So critical really comes down to the agencies, they're the people that have actually came up with the compliance issues and they write a lot of the testing schedules for us. And then they send us back a list of a spec basically and said, we need you, we want to test this, but we need you to make your system equal what we're asking for. So we will go out and do different testing with these. These guys are what I look at as the, as my baseline because if it's working for them, it's gonna work everywhere else I try to apply this stuff. Important manufacturing, these manufacturing sites, there's a lot of sites out there that are in the private sector that need just as much security as these guys, as the critical infrastructure guys do. And so what I do is principles never change. So I keep these principles that I learned here and I apply them here. So really the same technology is going into it. Sometimes we have to do a little adjustment because these guys usually have a lot more money than these guys do when it comes to the end of the day. So we really work hard at making sure that we're taking the tried and true stuff and bringing it into this industry. We have the like to have guys, you know, gated communities and stuff. We still have something for them also. We can do uh, analytics, we could do uh, some LIDAR mixed with analytics, but the, they're, they're just not gonna have the, usually I, they will not have the budget necessary to deploy this level of equipment. So we still work with them, but really these are the guys that are gonna be the heart and soul of uh, PIDs. So uh, we're, we're the same, we work, this is our primary focus group, I guess. That's, those are the people that really need line detection. Um, John and I were talking about this, going through this, and these like to haves, most of the like to haves and the important like to feel like they're over here. Um, most of them are not. 
And as John said, there's always a solution for them. For us, when I'm looking at a nuclear site or DOD, they have very specific applications on how to deploy our microwaves or very specific applications of how our fence sensors have to be deployed. Uh, with a microwave at a nuclear site, they're typically triple stacked. So you get detection to a certain height, right? Now, I sell the same microwaves to the importance and the likes like to have. Um, you never want to tell them that they're not really over here, but we've got to provide a solution for them. But I may, don't, they don't have the funds, they don't have the regulatory authorities, and they don't necessarily have the need to stack three microwaves high. Right. But one microwave will uh, get the walking, the running, the jumping you know, uh, target. And, and most of the time, it's, it's interesting. Um, we, I always talk about what is your threat definition at your site. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit more in the next slides. But understanding wherever you fit into this category, who is your assailant? Are they a trained, educated intruder? Do they know... Um, how to defeat certain type of systems? Do they know how these technologies work so that they can find the weak points? Do they know how to look for a weak point on a perimeter? If, if that's the assailant, then they likely end up over here, right? Um, on the other hand, you get some high security sites that really, they have to protect against these people, uh, or these, not, not these people, but they have to protect like they're here, but the the common problem that they have is the drunk college guy saying, oh, that's a cool fence, let me see if I can jump over and get over, having no idea where they're at. I look at, I was at a in Phoenix a couple weeks ago, and I was, I was dumbfounded. I, we were talking about doing a trial for some areas, and, and their problem is vagrants coming from a canal, thinking that it's a shorter path to walk instead of walking around. They mean no harm, but for the that's a huge risk. And so they're going to end up somewhere on this side of it, right? Even though their assailant is over here. So one of the big things that I really got to hammer home here is that cameras can be cameras and used to capture and document what's going on. And cameras can be sensors today. And most of our cameras that are deployed in these environments are sensors. The one big problem that I find is that I have a lot of customers come to me and they want the camera to be a camera, but they also want it to be a sensor. The problem is, is that the angles and things of that, they don't line up. When a camera's job is to be a sensor, you have to mount it the way it needs to be mounted as a sensor. When a camera is going to be for observation and documentation, you mount it in that manner. The key is using the right tool and making things happen in the right way. Um, other thing is environmental. Um, I'm going to tell you the first rule of thumb, get out to the site and look at the site. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at a blueprint, I've looked at a terrain document, and nowhere in there did I see the 12-foot uh, sewer pipe running underneath the fence line that I found when I walked the perimeter. Okay, well, I can put a million dollars worth of stuff up on your fence line, but if they can walk through a hole and get into your system, it's no good. So at that point, we're out there looking for different type of environmental situations, different structural situations. Uh, the tree that's hanging up that you could easily climb the tree and climb out on a branch and end up 20 feet on the other side of the fence, that type of stuff. So you really got to know what all of the conditions are before you try to deploy something like this. And that's when we come into play and actually we'll walk those sites with you and the Bosch team We've got really good people here that would be willing to go out there and help you walk those sites. Um, and basically, this is where we make the decision. What type of technology are we going to deploy out there based on what it is? And we are not afraid to bring all of our partners together if, if we feel that it's necessary to make the right, right decision. Yep. Right. Uh, so I, I, we're the same way self as microwave. I had a conversation with uh, this morning uh, regarding visiting a site, looking at an area. Uh, especially with certain systems. Southwest Microwave has to, there's always a balance, no matter what sensor you're talking about, between detection, probability of detection, and nuisance alarm rates. Um, when, you're, when you're at those sites that we were looking at before that are more towards the like-to-haves, then you want your nuisance alarm rate really low and you're willing to sacrifice some level of detection. When you get to the critical, you want your nuisance alarm rates really low but you're not able to sacrifice, sacrifice detection. 
And we, we talk a lot about the and, the or situation. The higher you are on the critical side of that, of that spectrum, the more or the less you're able to combine technologies together to create one alarm. Because there is a principle that says if I have to have an and, then my probability of detection automatically decreases. And so it's not that the sensors in any case are doing something wrong. You just have to look at them individually and make a, a, a assessment at that side to, to determine these things, right? So going to the site, looking for these things, John mentioned polls. I cannot tell you um, how many times I've been to a site and watched and looked at a camera pole, a tree, an electrical pole within five feet of a fence on either side. Yeah. If it's on the outside, people just scale it and jump over the fence. If it's on the inside, they just take a ladder and lean it up against it. These are, are common problems. These, these culverts that are there, the, they're, they're, there are so many pitfalls and getting out there and walking sites and looking at them is, is of immense importance. I have some systems that I won't sell. Um, they're great <coughs> detection systems, but if I haven't been to the site, I don't want you to have it. And the reason is not for any reason, but I want to protect you and I want to protect me because a poorly installed sensor, no matter what it is, or a sensor that's installed in an area that it doesn't need to be or is not designed to be, only creates headaches for manufacturers, integrators, and end users in the end. Okay. So this we're talking about, we sort of, this sort of culminates a lot of the things John and I have been talking about the last couple slides, but the, the bottom line is, you have to start with doing a risk assessment. You have to know what is the threat definition of your potential target. You have to understand uh, what, 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 is the, what is the risk that's it, you know, what is your asset? Are we protecting against copper thieves and you've lost air conditioning for a couple hours? Are we protecting against, you've got nuclear materials in there and World War III could be started if there's, uh, or, or mass huge areas are now uh, uninhabitable for a thousand years. Those are two different levels, but they both have to be addressed, right? And as a site, if you haven't done that risk analysis, that threat detection assessment, and then, and then we take it to another level. What if you're expanding? You know some of these things, but are you trying to integrate it into an existing system? That may determine what type of sensor, what type of application you need. Do you need remote, um, uh, remote viewing? Um, What's your time frame? You know, especially in today's day and age, lead times have become a real issue. Right. Southwest Microwave and Bosch have fared pretty well in this um, compared to some other manufacturers, but it's an issue, right? And we have to be able to, to address those things. Do you have a recurring issue that's been going on? It, do you have another sensor that's not working great that you need to figure out, do I replace it? Is it that specific technology? that needs to be replaced with a different one, or is it poor maintenance? These are things that you have to really look at and figure out what your problem is. So basically, we're just taking another look at the different types of uh, locations where we have these systems deployed, and uh, there's a great opportunity out there. This is a wide open market if you guys are integrators or selling this stuff, uh, and you're not chasing these PIDs projects, you're missing out because uh, my, Last two years have been almost pure PIDs, and it's been an amazing ride. So I would definitely recommend becoming really stout on this and understanding it and understanding how to help your customers become successful at protecting those perimeters. We want to end on the fact of what John's talking about. The, the market is growing, okay? Um, the market is growing on all levels. I, I tell people all the time, usually it's... it's um, Usually it's not us in the security world because we all know this, but it's I'm, I'm, I'm out to eat with the wife and some friends and somebody says, well, what do you do? And you start explaining it and they're in ooing and aahing because they don't really get it. And, and then they say, well, well, how's your industry doing right now? Talks of potential recession, all of these things. And I always answer it this way. The worse the world gets, the better our industry is going to do, the more it's going to grow, right? The more the risk that's out there, the more unstable market conditions are, the more unstable global uh, political tensions are, the, the more we are needed, the more we need to do our jobs better and provide uh, better solutions for, for our customers. So um, these are just some, some references to different articles about how fast it's growing and how great it's growing. But the bottom line is 
it's, a, it's an industry that's it's only progressed to grow over the next couple of years. Appreciate it.